eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year, church. That's what I'm talking about. One more time. Happy New Year, church. Let's stand, shall we? Those 1115ers are always late coming in. It's okay, though, but welcome to the worship service of the Gloucester County Community Church. We are an interdenominational, multicultural family of believers comprised of... Now, that was a bit anemic, don't you think? <laughs> We're going to try that again. Comprised of generations with a mission to, come on, SCS, let's say it together, share Christ, connect people, and serve others. Good morning, everybody. My name is Samaj Hazard. I am the youth pastor here at Gloucester County Community Church, and we are super thrilled to have you worshiping with us this morning. Now, it is 1115, so that means that we are live on Facebook, so I want you all to pull your phones out. Pull the phone out, and I want you to go on Facebook right now and tag a friend, tag someone, tag a non-believer, tag someone you love, someone you care about, someone you don't like, you know, tag somebody. That's what I want you to do, okay? I don't want you to let everyone know that we're having church to, uh, this morning at Gloucester County Community Church. Now, regarding masks, per CDC regulation, masks are no longer required. However, if you don't feel comfortable without a mask, feel free to wear it. Now, it is the rising weekend, so I think we should make some noise because we have a bunch of young adults that are rising that want to obtain a relationship with the Lord. We have a rising generation that wants to have a relationship with Jesus, and society doesn't teach that anymore. So I think we should make some noise. I'm, I make some noise. I want to hear you. Are you ready to worship? Make some noise. Because... Because with so many hardships in the world, with so much going on, our generation is not taught Jesus. But we have some people that are striving to love Jesus. We have a rising generation that wants to worship Jesus. I think we should make some noise for that. I think we should make some noise for that. Are y'all ready to worship? the time. 
of my heart You found me, you freed me Held back the waters for my release Oh yeah, yeah. You're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory
Humanility Lighthouse began in the Philippines by one of our GCCC's supported homegrown missionaries, Brian and Diane Thomas. They rescued street children that were orphaned by typhoons, property of warlords, victims of human trafficking, and those whose parent was incarcerated. I had the opportunity to visit the shelter in Bogo City on the island of Cebu and was warmly greeted as the first guest in two and a half years. A welcome feast celebrated the birthdays of all the children and staff and included Leishan, suggested by a family member, its roasted pig, songs and prepared dances. <laughs> Director Mommy Colin and the girls picked me up for a refreshing dip in the ocean and devotions were held by candlelight since the whole city had announced a blackout. The 13 younger boys arose at 4 a.m., eager to share the sunrise and walk on Old Pier. They had been confined to the compound throughout the pandemic until three weeks prior. The older boys shared their gifts and goals, following a devotion using Taryn Whale's new song, You Don't Have to Fake It. The staff are young, experienced, compassionate, and faithful. Dragon fruit stands were planted last fall with the promise that each child would tend one and could eat or sell any harvest. They regularly prayed for and watered their stand. Other skills included animal care, gardening, bicycle repair, and assisting with the construction of a new hut for the older boys. A summer reading program was instituted with rewards such as Jollibee and Hollow Hollow, a shaved ice dessert. Students will return to in-person learning at the end of August, and as Diane Thomas writes, those of you who have children and grandchildren will understand our supply issues for our children because they just keep growing. Our new project is the Back to School Project as we hurry to provide uniforms, backpacks, shoes, socks, and gym uniforms, along with the requisite school year supplies for all the kids. It will cost us about $100 per child. Please pray for God's provision. And if you are interested in helping, you may give at www.humanility.org or through GCCC and designate Humanility back to school in the memo. It all starts with you. wanted to parent and the, the, the way that I kind of was raised that parents would parent was is kind of there's different options um, and you know through the teachings I was able to work with my wife instead of against her we had a lot of you know in the beginning there was a lot of uh, different ideologies on how it should go about now we're a united front so that that's really helped the household while I'm reading the, the book training your child's heart um, finding out I need to make sure my heart is in the right place and devoted if I want to be able to raise my son 
it's kind of made me realize that I can't expect my son to follow, you know, God's word and, and how, you know, Jesus wants us to, to live if, if I'm not portraying that myself. I felt like when I left the, the first meeting, I just felt more prepared in my role as a parent and, and my role in, in disciplining um, with, with the love and wisdom of, of God's guidance. So I think if, if you kind of want that boost of, I don't want to necessarily say confidence because I know we don't want to seem overly confident in everything that we do, but I think it offers a good foundation and a strong guideline so you can feel successful to a certain extent. What I realized is that there was a lot of times where I questioned if I was on the right track with, with the way I, I was parenting and, um, and thought, you know, am I, am I doing this right? And when I came to the class, I realized that there's a lot of other people that, that have the same feelings and, and there's other people that are kind of doing, maybe making some of the same mistakes I am. Um, so I didn't feel so alone, you know, like I'm not, I'm not crazy. I'm, you know, I can do this. I can figure this out. I'll be okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that's how I felt too. You, you don't feel so alone in, in your parenting struggles, which in the moment, sometimes they're so difficult and, and you do, you feel isolated at times. And so that really opens that, that doorway up. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never thought it was going to be so hard, but it's something that you have to work out every day. And, and this, this teaches you or gives you something to go back to and kind of gives you a guideline on, on, you know, how to follow, you know, a curriculum for lack of a better word. E even if you are confident in your, in your parenting, there's always something to learn. Um, if, if you want to come out and, and, you know, meet new people, come on out on August 9th. Um, 7 p.m. And there's childcare. <laughs> <laughs>
Just a hunch, I guess. <laughs> One of my favorite moments from The Rising was when we went to the um, retreat in the Poconos yep. for a couple days. And that was amazing, an awesome experience. I remember we went to this diner and we had this thing called a German pancake. It's one of the most <gasps> delicious pancakes I've ever had. It's like a pancake with double the flavor. The retreat was really fun. And one of my favorite moments on the retreat was the first night we got there and it was just the guys, the ladies came the next day and when the guys got there, we had found these Nerf guns in the basement. <laughs> we found like this a bunch of Nerf guns and pellets, and let me say, we shut the lights off, we're like, we're going to war. So we had this fun experience. We went down that water slide that was like 100 feet high, what was it, like the fly trap or something like that? And that was where I learned that I can sing a few high octaves. But it was such a great experience, worshiping, uh, meeting new people, the food. The food. <laughs> I'd just say my favorite moment from The Rising is probably the Christmas party. So far. Probably when we were in the Poconos and had an all-girls car and we were jamming out on the way to the water park. Other young adults should come to The Rising because this is where the real-life experiences that you only hear stories about meet your experiences. It's a tough world out there, and it's a tough time to be our age. You know, studies show that statistically, young adults ages 18 to 30 are the hardest to reach in the church environment. They don't go to church anymore, period. So when people come to the Rising, they go, Mike, this is kind of like church for me, or Mike, I go to church, but I love coming here too, or Mike, I go to this church, and I love this church, and I love going to the Rising too. It's the perfect supplement. That's why I'm like, Every young adult should come to the Rising. I would say that people should join the Rising because it's a really, it's a really beautiful thing to have young adults come together with God being the center because that's very hard to find these days. I think it's a great place for like-minded peers, Christians who are young to meet together simply because of that. Because today, it's very difficult in today's world. You know, it's, it's a lot of chaos. People should come to the Rising because we make a lot of new friends and we have a lot of great memories that we continue to create with each other and we learn a lot about God. They should come to the Rising just to be connected, to have the, the family feel and meet some new friends and get closer to God. All people going in, just pursuing God and just doing our thing and not doing it alone, but doing it together. And that's why y'all should come because life is not supposed to be done alone supposed to be done as a family. It's supposed to be done as a family. Heather, and am I on? Here we go. I know my wife tells me I use my outside voice all the time inside. Any husbands get accused of that? Hey, being one of eight children, we had to speak loud to be heard. So I, I learned that as a child. We are excited that you are here on the Rising Sunday where you get to see our young adults, what God's doing in their lives, and hear from Michael, who leads the Rising, uh, share the power of who God is in their lives. For those of you who are new here, we welcome you. We're excited that you decided to become a part, or at least attend today, to be a part of what God is doing here. When you came in today, you received a connection card. Go ahead and pull that out. Okay, on the opposite side, you will see our connection card. Whichever side you're looking at, you will see a spot where you have an opportunity to fill that out. For those of you who are new or have never given us a record of your attendance, take a few moments fill that out, and then we ask you to do one of two things. One, you can either place it in the offering basket or before you leave today, head out to the lobby. That is our preference, where you can connect with someone at our connection desk, and we have some free gifts for you just for attending, either our great t-shirt or our travel mug. Both are great. One will keep you warm or even warmer now, and the other will, if you put ice 
drink in it will keep you cool. So your choice. Just want to highlight on the front of the connection card, we have a lot going on this month for families. We have the parent workshop on Tuesday night. And then at the bottom there, you will see every Wednesday night this month, we have a Bible study on a different topic. This Wednesday night, Gene and I will have the pleasure of taking you through Scripture, and we will share from our journey. And what we're still learning is the secrets of marriage success. It is a journey, right? Those of you who've been married, amen. So we're going to share some of those secrets that we've learned that have really enabled us to trust Christ and be Christ in the midst of our marriage. So we encourage you to come out this week. At this point in time, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare for the offering. Okay. We give to God because, number one, he tells us to and asks us to be obedient. But he asks us to do that most importantly because he longs for us to know him in the midst of our finances. For those of you watching online, you can give as well. Simply click on the link that is there that our host has provided and that will take you to where you can give. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, that you long for us to know you in each and every part of our lives. And we thank you that that is your longing. Your longing for intimacy. And you're longing for depth of relationship with us. So God, we give you our tithes and our offerings. Once, not only that we would know you more through our finances and what you've given us, but more importantly, that others would know you through these gifts. Use them, God. Advance your kingdom, not only here in this community, but across the world with what we give today. Lord God, we trust you. We thank you that you are everywhere. We pray specifically for those who could not be here today, Lord God. We pray they would know your presence. God, they would know you in a new and powerful way just where they are, and they would know your peace. We pray for the Brown family and the passing of Sandy. We thank you, God, that she is completely healed and with you and with John in heaven. But God, we do pray that her family would know your presence and your comfort in a very, very powerful way. God, thank you. Thank you for the work that you have done over the past 40 years within and through PB and Cheryl. God, we pray as they wrap up their, their time away somewhat from the church this week that it would be a restful time, but more importantly, you would give them a vision, Father, of what it is you have for them in this next chapter as they step down, yet not away, but step down from this work here, Lord God. Thank you. Thank you for the gift that they are to us. And we thank you for the next leader that you have anointed. We pray you would confirm this week as we get to see this gift of a candidate. We pray, Father, that you would bless he and his family as they travel out. We pray next week for a great time of connecting and getting to know them more, and more importantly, confirming your will of the next steps for our church as we trust you and build upon, Lord God, what you have done within and through PB and Cheryl. Father, we pray for Mike. For Michael, as he comes up, Lord God, and shares what you are doing within and through him, and most importantly, your word. Speak to him. Speak to us. Change us, God. We long to be who you've created us to be for two things, that we would know you more, and more importantly, others would know you more. And so it's the holy name of Jesus we continue to give this time of worship. Amen.
We praise you, Lord. You are here with us, Lord. We welcome your presence in this place, Lord. We surrender because you are holy. You are worthy. You are unmatched. You have no rival, no equal. Nobody can match your name, Jesus. Every sick bone in this place be healed in the name of Jesus. All anxiety and depression cease in the name of Jesus because you are holy, Lord, and you are the only one we are after. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and the church says, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, team. Thank you. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Now, when I was a child, when I was growing up in school, thank you, Oh, that's perfect. Oh, wow. That was like a second time. That's beautiful. Wow. That's what Alberto does, right? <laughs> thank you, Ryan. Now, when I was younger, growing up in school, I was a bit of a chameleon, right? I could fit in any lunch table, any group of kids, except for the ones who bullied me. I, I couldn't do that, though. But I fit in just about anywhere. I was a chameleon. I was just trying not to make any waves and just be cool with everybody. That was my whole methodology, like going to school. Mike's the classifier. That's how I made it, right? Now, the truth is, doing that, I ended up just being a thermometer, right? You know what a thermometer does? Thermometer what? It tells the temperature. All it does is tell the temperature of what's happening in the room, outside, whatever. Like it's hot, yeah, a thermometer told you that in your phone. But then on my journey throughout going to high school, I realized that that's not all I wanna be. It's not. I don't wanna just be a reflection of what other kids did, right? They said things they shouldn't have said. I said some things I shouldn't have said. They were going here. I was going there. I just wanted to be cool. I wanted to fit in. That was it. I'm talking about high school. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do something different. So at that point, I was like, you know what? I don't want to be a thermostat anymore. Became a thermo sorry, a thermometer anymore. I want to be a thermostat. You know what a thermostat does? A thermostat sets the temperature. And when you be the kind of person that sets the temperature, which is what our focus is going to be on today, that's the kind of person that's going to help advance the kingdom. That's the kind of person. So, let's get into it. We ready? We good? We ready? I'm making sure I keep y'all awake now. Don't, don't sleep on me now, okay? We good? All right, perfect, perfect. All right. Now, as we go through, okay, this is a little backwards here. All right, who needs notes? We're, gonna, we're doing no notes. We're going. So, being the kind of person that's a thermometer, it's not that great. You want to be a thermostat. And as we dive in to the social life of a Christian. The social life of a Christian is one where it's about the reflection of what's inside of you. And there's three main factors that make us different socially, right? The first one that makes us different socially is the fact that we understand that we were born with a purpose. We are born value and purpose. And we say it every single week, right? In fact, we'll look at Jeremiah 1.5. Go to Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to nations. Now, God was talking to Jeremiah, but the living word is speaking to you. I set you apart. So we know as a Christian, we're set apart differently. Secondly, we're also trying to build some intentional friendships. That's also what Christians should do. You don't just be friends with just anybody. You ever get really bad advice from an unbeliever? Yeah. Jessica, 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 I think my boyfriend's cheating on me. And non-believer Jessica says, cheat on him back. Cheat on him. Go ahead, find somebody else. No, cheat on him back. It's like, whoa, easy, Jessica, right? When you have friends who are in the word, you go, hey, I think something's going on. Hey, you know what? There's nothing that, is in, there's nothing that the world can throw at us that's not already in the word of God, right? There's nothing new under the sun. So there's a, you know what, I'm going to focus on having some friends and build them intentionally. Having an intentional set of values that line up together through the word of God. That's important. And the third thing that will set us apart from other, from the world and other people as believers is we marry on a mission. Now look at me. I'm not married, okay? I'm not going to give you marriage advice, okay? In fact, I'll take some from you one of these days, all right? However, we focus on marrying on a mission. It's a marriage that moves forward. But today, here's where we're going to focus. We're going to focus specifically on building intentional friendships. 
Now, building intentional friendships, where are they going? Where do they start? It's a focus that, you know what? I want to be able to set myself apart from other people in order to truly make a difference. Now, I'm going to have everyone stand up with me. We're going to do a little passage reading. Let's go to, let's go to 1 Timothy. We're going to go to 1 Timothy. We're going to do chapter 4, verse 11. Read this with me. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture and preaching and teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You may be seated. You save both yourself and your hearers. Now that's important. That's what the rising is all about. I remember our first leadership meeting we had with the leaders of our group. And I sat and I said, listen, here's the expectation you have of me. Here's the expectation I have of you. And that is straight up here in 1 Timothy. It's about being an example. So where does all this begin? Building intentional friendships. There's going to be three main points we'll focus on today. When you build intentional friendships, one, it's about who's in you. It's about, secondly, who's around you. And lastly, is who you impact, right? Tell your neighbor, say neighbor. Oh, come on, say neighbor. It's about who's in you. It's about who's around you. And it's about who you impact. So let's start backwards. Here it is. So when Jesus, who you impact, when Jesus met people, when sinners encountered Jesus, who changed, Jesus or the sinners? The sinners change, that's right. So when people encounter you, do you change or do they change? Who's the thermometer and who's the thermostat in that situation? You see, people went to Jesus and they received healing. They went to Jesus. Just one touch made a difference in their whole life. Woman at the well, Jesus spoke her, spoke her life to her and then spoke truth to her, changed her entire life and she went and told people, now, when people encounter you, who's the one who's really changing? Now, how do we embody being like Jesus in this manner? How do we do it? Here's how we do it. We focus on the standard of holiness. The standard of holiness. Why? Here's what the church tends to do. Here's what modern church will do. We'll say, church is a hospital for the broken. And it really is. However... When you've been attending this hospital for years and years and years and years and leading and serving, and for some reason, you're still a patient. Doesn't the hospital have nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors, anesthesiologists, whatever? But in the kingdom, we have the great physician. But then there's people in the in, the in between who bring other people up from the bottom. So you keep attending without making that difference. Now, what's interesting about that is if you're a believer, are we not called to more to, to bring other people into the gospel too, to bring other people into the truth? If that's what we're called to do, we've got to have a, a stern focus. And that focus is the standard of holiness. Because if somebody comes and sees a believer, they see you in church, you on Sunday, you go in, you do a little praise dance on Sunday, you do the whole thing. And next thing you know, they catch you in the streets. They catch you on what? They catch you on the road, cussing people out and just trying to cut them off. They cut you off in this whole thing. They hear you cussing and screaming. They catch you at, at like Olive Garden or something, having like four glasses of wine, you're drunk out. Like what in the world? Being a believer, it's a standard of holiness. You want to impact people around you. Be the kind of Christian people want to be around. Be the kind of Christian where you look in the mirror, you're like, I'm proud of who I see because I see Jesus in me. And so do other people. They see Jesus inside of you. That's the person you got to be. Interestingly enough, if you didn't know, 
my car. I used to drive the red Prius. You see it everywhere. And, <laughs> and actually, it cracked out. You know, it's, it's done. Yeah, head gasket issue. It's completely done. So yeah, I'm not driving the car right now. I take lips. I get rides. It's, it's really all it is. And as much as it's not that big of a deal, there's bigger things in the world to worry about. Today, I was on my way here this morning, had a Lyft driver. His name was Marcus. And then we're, I'm in the car with Marcus, and he had, like, whatever music on. No, oh, whatever. And then he switched to Caleb. I was like, oh, you piqued my interest. He was switched to Caleb. So he switched to Caleb, and then knowing the destination was the church, he was like, hey, you're going to the church kind of early? And I was like, yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'm actually preaching today. So, oh, wow, that's really cool. And we sat there in silence for a second, and then he just started to completely unload. You ever have people just unload on you out of nowhere? You're like, oh, praise the Lord. Okay, great. Like, this completely unloaded. He was like, hey, me and my wife were in Florida, and we were on the precipice of divorce. So we came to New Jersey, and then we just tried to live life, but, like, we weren't doing too well. And then we started going to church, and she was already in, in the church, but he wasn't. They married unequally yoked. So the interesting thing about it was, he told me, this was my testimony, he said, so before they had moved to Florida the first time, they lived in Camden, and he was at a check cashing place, you know, it was like, you know, check cashing, you get the cash for your check and all that stuff, and there's a safe in there with the cash, so he's going to work one day, and then he gets stuck up by somebody, had a gun, went in, right as he was opening up, opened the store, pushed him in behind him, give me all the money, give me all the money, so he went to the back, he was so nervous, I mean, he's holding a gun, he was so nervous, and when he went, he went to the safe, and then he tried to do the combination, and he told me, he's like, he does this every day, he's the manager, he opens the safe every day, he was so nervous, he forgot the combination. And he was trying, and he was going, he's like, I just can't get it, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. Then the guy yanked him up, put the gun in his eye, pushed his eyeball back. And he said, he was cursed, he was like, open the safe, I'm going to blow your brains out. Now, this guy, Marcus, being an unbeliever at the time, he went back down and he whispered to himself. He said, God, please open this safe. Lord, please open this safe. And then he turned it. Now, this is one of those combinations that are five digits, he told me. He had to turn at least five, six times to get there. He said, click once, click twice, boom, opened. It opened right there, right there. No combo was needed. It opened. Guy took all the money and ever, but he was like, that was his moment. He said, he said, I know you're looking out for me. My life, his life was never the same again. He said, I, I'm serving you. That's it. And that's when he started coming to church and he started making a difference. And just in that, now we were in a parking lot. We prayed. We had a really good time. A really great ride. Best 15 minutes in the morning. I came in here. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, right. And I just like, wow, praise the Lord. What a story. What a life. We all have stories like that where God has called you to more. And he even told me, he was like, that's how I knew that it wasn't my time to go and that I really had like a reason to be here. I was like, yeah, man, you're born with value and purpose. And you know that firsthand. Absolutely beautiful. And that's what happens when you impact other people. Being the kind of Christian that somebody can offload onto and be able to go, this is my life. You go, God is with you. You experience God is with you. He's never going to leave you. He will never forsake you. You be that kind of Christian, and those are the kind of people who you will attract. Like I said, it's about looking in the mirror. It's all about looking in the mirror. Now, that's first is impacting people, right? Who you impact. Next is who is around you. The people who are around you. In fact, we'll go to Proverbs 13, 20. Proverbs 13, 20. It says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. You want to be a Christian that walks with the wise people. You do not want to walk with fools. You don't. Have you ever heard, uh, what are some of those really good cliche quotes? Show me your friends and I will show you who you are. My dad said to me all the time, show me your friends, I'll show you who you are. Show me your five best friends and you're going to be the next one. You're just going to be just like them. It really is true. It's right there in Proverbs. But you see, that's not always the hardest part of trying to connect yourself with good people. The hard part is when you have those other people who aren't as good trying to latch on to you, leeching off of who you are, off of your energy. We have those people who just call you just because like, they need something when they call you. They never call us to talk to you. They always need something, right? You have the people who, like, aim me from the back. So I had that friend. 
You have people who will call you and reach out to you, always in need of something. They never, never have anything to add. They just suck all the energy out of you. Maybe you're like a high school friend. Oh, we're just best friends. Just got so used to saying it. Oh, we're just best friends. We're best friends. And to this day, are they really your best friend? Are they really? As you've grown closer to Jesus, are they the kind of person that you want to say, hey, it's my, it's my best friend? Really? You know, fall is coming. Autumn is coming. And I get your Starbucks cups ready, your pumpkin, your, and all the stuff that you get ready. Maybe this fall is the season that you let some leaves fall off the tree. Maybe it's time for you to let some people go. And you, gotta, you speak to them. You, you, you preach to them. You share the gospel. You've done what you can. You've planted the seed. Let the seed germinate. Let God do what he does. But that does not mean you have to stay as tight as this. It doesn't mean that. Because God has a calling for you to move forward. Get this. Listen, there are times where if you connect yourself with the wrong people, it will hold you back from your calling. It absolutely can. Because where God is trying to move you out here, you're too busy out here. When God's like, hey, I want you to go to the Rising on Friday and meet some people. You out here in Philly in the club on Friday. Hey, I'm getting on the club on Friday, man. I'm in Philly in the club. And you're like, no, no, it's not where you're supposed to be. I want you somewhere else. God wants you somewhere else. And that's where your focus has to be. But if you're, but if you're with the group that goes there, no one wants to be the one person that goes out. You don't want to be that person. But you need to be that person. They need you to be that person. God is calling you to be that person who is separated, just like you were by birth, to move the other direction. That's who you are called to be. And it starts here, right here, right now, making a decision to be separate from the world. You see, you watch the modern church sometimes, and we know we all see it, where we say we're separate from the world. But 89% of what we do looks just like the world. It's a bit suspicious. You're like, oh, everything we do, this looks just like the world. It's like, no, we're called to be different. We don't have to make church like the world to get people to come. No, 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 no. Jesus was Jesus, didn't change anything, and people came to him. And when they came to him, they were changed. That's the truth. We don't have to change ourselves for the world. The world will come here and be changed. That's the key. That's the key. And as we walk through this life of, of making friends and having people, walk where God wants you to walk. And in that walk, you know what's going to happen? You're going to make new friends. You're going to have new people in your life who aren't afraid to pray. You're going to have friends in your life who aren't afraid to worship, who are not afraid to say Jesus' name. I don't care how old you are. I really don't. I don't care if you're in middle school. You can be the person who raised their hands and say, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is king. He is Lord. Let the kids look at you weird. That's fine. That's fine. Let them look at you weird. I am, I am weird. I'm different, than, I'm different than the world. Because you know what? I watch how the world ends up, and you know what? I don't want to do it. I sign off. I don't want to do it. That's not who I want to be. I will be different. And then when you get, oh, here's the key. You get other people around you who want to be different too. And when you're a thermostat, right? You're not a thermometer anymore. You're a thermostat at that point. And they have other people who are thermostats. And you're a thermostat, and you're a thermostat, and you're a thermostat, and you're a thermostat. You know what happens? We all crank the temperature all the way up on fire for Jesus. And then that, that is when things change in the world. When you have a bunch of thermostats that refuse to be low on temperature. They don't want to be lukewarm. They want to go up. They want to rise. We want to raise the temperature for Jesus because right there, that's the key. You raise the temperature and the world, they'll watch us burn. They will in the best way possible. Now, here's our, here's our last point. So we talked about who you impact, who's around you. Now we're going to talk about who is in you. When people see you, what are they seeing? We're going to start at 1 John 4.4, 4, King James Version. How about you read this? Stand up. You guys can stand up and read this with me. Come on. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I mean, greater is he who is in me? 
and I interact with other people, you already know what's about to go down. You know we're about to worship. You can be seated. We actually went to uh, an event last Sunday called Resonate. It's a concert. It's a, it's a Christian concert. Yeah, it was awesome. Christian concert. And then Al Chase and I had shown up early and we went and we're like, you know what? Where can we serve? We're ready to serve. This is going to be awesome. Where do we serve? They're like, okay, we're going to join the prayer team. Great. We'll do the prayer team. Got little badges. It was cool. So after the pastor was done preaching a little bit, as worship continued, they had us come up to the front. Just like they came up to the front, and then people came out, and they stepped out in faith, and they worshiped, and they prayed with us. Now, I had this young lady come to me, and she was, she was praying with me, and I asked her, you know, she already came up in tears, too, already in tears. And then I asked her, what's going on? What can I pray for you for? And she said, my friend is so lost, so lost to the world. You see, as she was moving closer to Jesus, her friend was just out there and wouldn't receive. And from there, you know, I prayed and I remember praying over her saying, listen, God will bring your friend back. If it is his will, it will be done. Trust in the Lord, but don't stop being the believer that you are. Because that is what's watching that being that example is how your friend will start to come back. That's the key. But it all started with who was in her, who was in her. Now we're going to go to the next scripture here. We're going to go over to, we're going to go over to Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, change his name, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The same God who told Peter, do you know who I am? And Peter's like, yeah, I know exactly who you are. And then God said, on this rock, I will build my church. But understand, in the Greek Peter means rock. He didn't mean where they were standing. He didn't mean the soil of the ground. He's like, Peter, on you, I will build my church on this rock right here. Now, God is talking to you right now. Do you know who I am? Will you look in the mirror? Do, 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 do people see Jesus in me? Do you know who Jesus is? It was due to the confession that Peter made that I know exactly who you are. You are the son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the savior. And that's the same God in Peter. That's the same God in you. And he's telling you, you know who I am. I will build my church right here, right where you are. You will be a part of something bigger than yourself. And the gates of hell, they have nothing to say about it. It doesn't get a say. Because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Go ahead and stand to your feet for me. Now, if you are here and you're like, hey, Mike, listen, I hear you, but I just don't know if Jesus is really living in me. I just don't know. And the chances are, if you don't know, maybe he isn't. But right here, right now, This is your opportunity. This is your chance to say, Jesus, I want you to live in me. I want to be the kind of Christian, the kind of believer that is set apart. I don't want to be like everybody else anymore. I want to be able to live in a way where people look at me and they go, I want to be like them because it's Jesus who's shining in you. God, that's who I want to be. And even if you use your own standard, I think we all know that we've done things that are wrong. Way back at the rising, I asked a question. I was like, hey, anybody ever stolen something before? I was like, yeah, yeah, maybe. 
You ever lied before? Every hand went up. Okay, that's two out of the Ten Commandments. You're not doing so good, right? If we went through all of them, I won't paint you through it. But if you did, you already know. You ain't making a cut. But that's because Jesus, Jesus came in the middle. He said, no. It's like the courtroom, and Jesus came in and said, I'll, I'll, pay, the, I'll pay the price instead. Let them go. I'll do it. And Jesus did that for each and every one of you. So to do that means you're free. And in your freedom, in that, that debt that we can never repay, it's the idea that I want to move forward for Jesus. I want to bring as many people with me as possible. So what we're going to do together, we're going to sign that proverbial contract. Because all it takes is ABC. One, you admit that you're a sinner. You know you've done things that are wrong. B, you believe that Jesus himself came to earth and died on that cross for you. And C, you commit your life to him. You be the kind of Christian other people want to be, want to be like. Unbeliever or believer alike, they will see Jesus in you. I promise, they will. And D, you do it today. So we're going to raise every single one of you. Raise your hands. As high as you can, raise your hands to the heavens. Close your eyes and repeat after me out loud. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. I know I've done things that are wrong and you called those things sin. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross and I believe that I will be with you in heaven. I commit my life to you today and I will make that choice right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, second time, you've prayed it for years, but something just felt a little different today, let us know. Let us know that, you, you know what, I want to recommit my life to Jesus, or just so you know what, I want to commit myself today. Today, I'm saved by grace, and I will never be the same again. Thank you for your time. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Can we give Mike one more round of applause, everybody? Come on. Let us not play hide and seek and let the world see Jesus within us. We just want to thank you all for joining us here at the Gloucester County Community Church, those in person and online. Now, a um, few final instructions. Please remain in your row until dismissed by an usher. We have opened the chapel for those of you who like prayer. Hey, Jada, can you open up the doors, please? Thank you, Jada. And um, we do um, have the JMS seat back open for snacks. All right, we're getting over that COVID stuff. So the JMS is open for fellowship. And uh, yeah, that deserves a round of applause, right? It definitely does. And we're going to remind visitors to place all correspondence, FTDs, offering, and et cetera, in the baskets on the way out. And newcomers, please come to the main lobby to receive their free gift. Oh, I, 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 got, I got you. I got you. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Hang tight. Hang tight. I got that. I'm just getting, getting this out the way first. All right. <laughs> All right. Now, and we have lawn signs for sale in the lobby for $5. We cover the rest of the cost. So there's only $5 out in the main lobby. All right. Now, see, it's on the slide. It says, lead the congregation and the proclamation after the announcements. I got it. Okay, now how about we proclaim our value and purpose, everybody, already two hands in the air, and we're going to say it with gusto, double blessing for two hands. Let's do it. Here we go. I was born with value and purpose. My life has promise and potential as it unfolds in accordance to God's eternal plan. Now, how do we know that? Because Psalm chapter 7 verse 9 says this, and let's read it together. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure you. The righteous God who probes minds and hearts. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Now, 
Can I leave you all with a blessing? All right. Doug, what are you saying now, man? All my instructions are right there. I don't know why they think I don't know what I'm trying to say. All right. Here we go. May the peace of the Lord be upon you as you leave the sanctuary today. Allow people to see Jesus within us. Allow us to increase our social life in the eyes of you, God. In the midst of turmoil, in the midst of division and adversity, you never change. and You're always sovereign. And we thank you for that. So I pray that people see Jesus within us. And we're not the Christians that play hide and seek, but we're the Christians that are showing your love to the world. And we thank you for that. Amen. Be blessed, JMSC Chapel. Hope to see you all soon.